to the most part we're dealing with wrought iron, a little bit of cast iron by way of decoration, and occasionally, as we're speaking about our own monuments and own graves, etc., uh, galvanized steel. Uh, that that will also be, you know, that's also a factor. Um, heritage iron work. In this, I'm speaking about wrought iron work. Will be due to three uh, main main factors: the quality the quality of the iron itself. Wrought iron comes in bar form, and it came in different qualities, and basically you paid for what you got. Your crown iron, your best iron, your best best. There was double the work in each of those uh, uh, categories, and those uh, there were corresponding costs. If we get really good iron here, having come through, say about 200 years at this stage, to the most part that's best best. Now another factor, and this and this is what we're mainly speaking about. Cleaning and painting. That's really, that's really the life of what is there. You want to keep uh, the moisture at bay. And on the subject of moisture at bay, keep earth and vegetation away. I'll, I'll, I'll sample later on um, that shows the effects of vegetate or um, earthwork and earth in particular. It just holds the moisture there. The rain is gone. We're in the middle of summer. It's still in moisture. So it's still rotting away. It, get, it, gets, it gets no chance. To a lesser extent, vegetation. It keeps the airway from drying it and holds moisture to it. So keep the hedge back, back from it. Uh, cast iron is a bit different. It's, it's a far more brittle material, but it's formed by pouring molten iron into a cavity in molded sand. Basically you have a sand flask, you have an impression of the piece that you want in, in, on, on both sides of this pattern, press it into the sand, you do the same on the other, bring the two together and put holes into it to allow metal in and air out. And you break those bits off afterwards, they, they, uh, they remain on the, on the cast item as little spew lines and you break those off afterwards and there you have your item. So it's very, it's very repeatable. You, know, you can do the same thing over and, they, and they're very consistent. You do the same thing all the time. Um, wrought iron is a fibrous, we shouldn't be doing it here now as early as this, but we'll just something for the hand anyway. Wrought iron is a fibrous material. It's made up of layers of iron and a kind of a rough silica slag formed by a rough glass. And it's very fibrous. Sounds a bit like timber. And how it works is the iron will corrode away, you know, rel rel uh, relatively quickly. And the layer of silica slag will stop the corrosion for quite a while. But eventually that will go. And we're back to a layer of iron again, and so on. Also, the silica slag is dispersed randomly and in layers, so the, the corrosion is uneven. Steel is more homogeneous mix. Uh, it needs, as you can read there, it doesn't, it doesn't do well in our climate. Um, it needs something else to protect if we put a layer of zinc on it by way of hot dip galvanizing. But that in itself will corrode. So that will need paint and that's where you people come in. Me as well. When wrought iron rusts, you see this on gates, it expands. The rust takes up an awful lot more volume than what the original iron did. And if you look at the side of a gate, You'll see the slap on the slam plate. It'll come down like so. So the ribs are holding it still. They, they, they in turn will go. And the rust is pushing the plate out. No, I'll just skip on to one slide here. We'll go back to this as we're on this particular point. Hopefully I'll be better at this today. Yes. It wasn't so good yesterday. 
you see here, the pressures exerted when the urn expands. They will push the lead. Might have been packed that, that, that terribly well. And you can get a, a crack running right through the stone. It'll burst the stone. The pressures are enormous in it. Right. Heavy paint tends to dull detail. This is something that's actually very pleasant when you're when you're cleaning uh, ironwork in you know in the graveyard or whatever. There'll be detail that that will emerge that you won't know was there, that you generally won't know was there, and that can be really quite something. The paint and rust do hold pieces together. When you're looking, when you're looking at a railing or gate or whatever, sizing it up initially, you have a certain amount of material. Invariably, when you clean it, you will have that bit less. There are always bits that are, they'll be gone in five or ten years, but at the moment, uh, our intervention is going to dislodge them. There will be, you know, there will be certain losses, almost, <coughs> almost, uh, almost invariably. Some of the you know, we have restoration, we have conservation. Restoration doesn't really apply to us here in Cork so much. It will 10, 20 years time, but uh, at the moment, not so. We do more conservation here. But to put it back, as it were, you'll have joints in in a length of railing. The, bar, the bars that they got were way shorter than what we have now. So the pieces were generally about 10 feet long or so. And they'd be joints on those, you know, uh, section to section. Um, this is just one piece of that overlap uh, that shows the difference, but there there are others. When those joints uh, overlap, you have rivets holding them. And you know it would be nice to put things back as they were, but that's not always possible. There were different grades of wrought iron, and they would use a soft wrought iron to rivet up those. Today we don't we don't really have that. So we, we have steel rivets. Steel rivets are going to need heat, and we can't really bring heat to our expensive, expensively finished railing. So that's why there are these differences you know, between what, what was you know, practiced then and what are our practices today. There are others as well, but, that, but that's one of the more obvious ones. Now, as I said, this is like wood in a sense. A lot of the work, a lot of the original iron work grew out of woodwork. So they want to put say a bar off here, T-shape. They didn't have you know electric welders etc that we have, not that they're a good idea but we'll get to that. So they would have to open it this is steel but it will illustrate the point. They'd open it like so, hot, with, how would they use harder metals to open it? They slit it first, and then use a punch. You know, you you can you can punch it various ways. Once once you have the slit done, you can put a square hole there, and you can put a rectangular hole there. You can put a square on the diagonals. You can do all sorts of things with it, and then make a tenon on the other piece, and it would go. Trim that to length. And you rivet it or grab it back, and that was the that was the joint. So it's very very similar to to woodworking in that respect. No. Oh, uh, Bradley was just beaded back, is it? Huh? Bradley was just beaded back, is it? Or, or yeah, it's you know you'll have riveting, which is which is a separate piece of metal with kind of rivet head and that sort of thing. Bradley is doing the same thing to metal that you formed, but isn't rivet. You know what I mean? Uh, you beat it back, is it? Or yeah. Know, yeah. 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 You can use the word riveting, but actually, bradding is the older word for that. Yeah. Uh, you may get damage, and there's a temptation to pull a welder out and weld up the two bits, you know, onto here. As I said, this is a laminate structure. You know what you're welding onto. You can be welding onto something very thin, it comes under any sort of load. It breaks off. You're back further than other than, than when you started. So that is not a good uh, that's not a good solution. 
And if you're not, and in most cases you're not, taking the railing away, you're doing it in situ. So you're better off just adding bits. Always, always think of when you're doing any sort of restoration, we don't want to take any, uh, anything away. You know? We want to list as close to the original as possible, certainly not, certainly not less. So you make up you know, little spices, extra piece that you'll put in and bolt, as opposed to welding, which will do damage. Also, in terms of, you know, from the restoration point of view, we must be conscious about kind of our own contingency. You know, we might be doing it wrong. We give people who, you know, things are always advancing. We give the next generation a chance to have their go at it as well. Hopefully they're, hopefully they're better than us. You know, we just give them. Uh, I'll be coming to aspects of that, for instance, with galvanizing, etc. later on. No. This actually is very important, perhaps the most important bit. We're doing safety first, we're cleaning railing second. The most important thing is that, you know, we don't, we don't do any damage to ourselves. I'll be doing some, we'll be talking in a minute about one of the main things that we get a lot of the material, or the unwanted material off the railing, is with using right, a cut brush. There's a fantastic amount of work in a very short period of time. It was dangerous. You use this for a while, and you're going, and you know, it's going to go down and down and down. It's going to wear away. When that's wearing away, the bits are actually flying away. They're worse than sparks. They'll do more damage. So we must protect ourselves with glasses, goggles. In the case of this, earmuffs and that sort of thing, and the people who, who might be walking close close to you. Also, keep this person away. You know, have this person doing the major work on one part of the railing. The other people doing the smaller work on another part, so that, so that they don't get injured. Now, I'll be skipping on in various bits that I didn't bring them back to bring to the workshop and didn't put it back. Oh, uh, it did make a trick. Masks. Any paint that, you know, like the way I'm going to show you in a minute is this one. Very old. It hasn't been painted in living memory. Any paint that's older than, say, 1960 or so will, will have laid. Even some of the paints afterwards, because all these changes are always gradual. So when you're, especially with the cup brush, you're making dust of what is old paint. That, that invariably has lead in it. You don't want to ingest any of that because lead is cumulative in the body. These are the old-fashioned masks. I don't rate these as any good. These sort of things, they're very good. They're molded for the face. There's a lot more protection here than there is in that. And the piece and the filters are replaceable. Way better job. You're worth it. You protectors mentioned that mask. Access. Granted, if there's an insert gate, sometimes there's an insert gate. You have a railing on top, and you have a double layer on the top rail, and there can be a little gate there for access and note. If, that is, if that's not there, you need an A-frame ladder. No point in climbing up and down over it. You know, that's not, going to, that's not any good. An A-frame ladder that gets you up and over nice and safely. And Michigan tools later on, kind of gardening tools, that sort of thing, it's very important to clear the ground that you're working on, that you know what you're standing on. You, know, you have to be very, very safe. With no digging. Huh? <laughs> Materials we've worked on, wrought iron as discussed, cast iron, old paint, lead. Um, lead is used in holding ancillary bits together on a railing. You know, that's leaded in, that's leaded in. Some of these are leaded in, uh, and sometimes there's lead between the rail and this. Sometimes pins underneath, but often lead. Galvanized steel is mentioned. 
Brass, bronze and aluminium are usually dec uh, decorative pieces. The aluminium will be from the 1930s onwards. Uh, we don't really have to consider to think too much about those. The aluminium is, um, came to a whole lot with that. A lot of aluminium salts coming out to the paints and that sort of thing doesn't, doesn't much you can do except just keep on painting it. Sand it down, keep on painting it. Brass and bronze, polish them up. They're actually good to weather. You know, they don't need anything on them. No. Different materials. Wrought iron. Comes in bar form. It's formed on the forge. Formed hot. Uh, you can do various things with it. You know, we'll have a, a mortise and tenon joint here. We have scrolls here. We have a forge welded uh, small scroll here. This will actually go up in here to mirror that. Um, the likes of this one. It comes uh, a bulb with two scrolls coming this way. It was very fluid, very plastic, brought out the artistic uh, streaking people. This one is cast iron, hard, crisp. Uh, this is probably late 19th century, early 20th century, uh, holding up very well. There isn't any corrosion or anything. There's a panel that over here a little bit that got some mechanical damage, maybe got hit with a car or, you know, part of the JCB or something. And that is damaged, but this is pristine. Sometimes uh, you're old or then you see the old blacksmith plates and there was zinc or something put into the metal and uh, are you actually damaging them by painting them? Say again, no, I'll come the old, to you. The, the old blacksmith? Yes. Yeah. You know, they had the rivets and all that. Right? Yeah. Uh, and they had the zinc or something mixed in with the, the metal when they were being forged. And they didn't, they didn't they, there was a rust coating came on them, but they didn't rust away. Are you actually damaging by painting? No. 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 Painting always protected. Yeah, painful, painful, right. Right. protected. It will last to quite an extent on its own. It will certainly do a hell of a lot better than steel. Um, but no, it, it, it also needs help. It's um, basically how, how we regard it. Iron is constantly trying to get back to its natural or or state. It doesn't like being in a hard worked state that we like it in. It always wants to get back to its original oxidized, oxidized state, which would be an ore. The closest it can get to that is rust. So that's what we're, that's what we're trying to prevent. Was there always paint of that so in the past? They were? In, in the 19th century, the 18th century? Oh, oh yes, if we go back before Queen Victoria, there were lovely colours in it. Uh, things became very, very sombre in the, in the second half of the, of the 19th century onwards. And, we still, and, we, and we're still, we're still in love with Victoria, you know, Victorian values, if it, it would seem. Um, this thing is when we combine them. I reckon about early 1800s, we've wrought iron, these vertical bars, these horizontal rails. These and these are wrought iron, with these and these being cast iron additions let it on. And this is a later version. We've wrought iron verticals, wrought iron rails, and cast iron decorations. Now what you'll notice in this, the, that top rail is in very bad condition. The cast iron finials, apart from the bad paint, are very good. The bottom rail, however, has vanished. I just put this on just to hold, to hold it together. So we see just probably, you know, in, in earth, in vegetation, uh, it's typical of what you find in that. Now, what you'll also find, please don't you know. I have to go to the back of the hotel so that they don't find who made this other place. Rain, and rain is essentially what we're dealing with. Long-term effects of rain. The vertical bars are fine because the rain runs off those very, very fast. The horizontals hold the rain for a hell of a lot longer. Um, this one now would be 19th century, so it could be any time in the 19th century. That one is uh, earlier. 
Um, these bits are leaded and we just cleaned up. It looks a bit like this. So all the detailing all that has emerged in that. It's actually quite good, Nick. Apart from the uh, apart from the horizontal bits. These are still leaded in. You can see the lid here on top. This is usually leaded. I'm not so sure about this. I think this one might have been uh, cast in place. Had a wrought iron bar, put it into the flask and cast that on the bar. It's something I'm coming across lately. It wasn't in the it wasn't kind of thought to be so, but I'm certainly finding these around Cork anyway. <laughs> Techniques and procedures. Pick it dry day or evening. Because when you clean when you when you clean the metal, you need to paint it straight away. Not paint it the following morning, paint it that evening. Very important because you don't you know you want to be ahead of the rust. Start here again. Yeah. Don't go as far as bright, bright metal if you if you if you can avoid it. That's all the dull. That's what you want. This one's. That's that's the sort of surface that you're looking for. You don't want to get back to the raw metal. No, no, because there's kind of there's a little layer on this, and it helps to protect the metal. Helps protect what you had. That's what you're looking for. No. We go back to this. Going back and forth, bit, bit by bit. This. And a famous cup brush. This will do a lot of the work. This will do, you know, kind of 90-95% of the work in a very, very short period of time. You'll be ages during the last 5% of it and you have to, you know, that's what you're kind of signed up to. You can go out here easily, you can do around here. Sometimes if the bars are too far apart, you can go in here. You have to be careful. Um, difficult to say in this day and age, but I'd recommend not having music, that's all they on, concentrate. Because if this thing jams, there's going to be a kickback on it. So you can go around a fair bit. You can't really go in there because it'll jam. You put one and a quarter horsepower on this. So you know you have to be careful with it. So you can go right uh, from here, right around to here. And here, you can do the surface of this. But going back to this piece, finish this off with kind of foils, scrapers, you know, uh, a bit of army cloth or something. Try not to get back to bare metal. If you use your foil, try to use an old one as opposed to as opposed to a new one. New ones tend to cut quite hard. You can get in here a bit with this. It'll do the kind of the surface. You can do a bit of this here on the side, and then you change to. Thank you. Thanks, Mary. <coughs> Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes. You can use a softer version, and that will go in another bit for you. It won't. It won't. It, it won't go all the way in. You can put that on the small grinder, and you can get in another bit. You have to finish off then. Unfortunately, thank you. Oh, we have to immediately every day. We don't have scrapers. A little small radius on that because you're not just kind of you know you're not just scratching it. You you actually want to take out paint, foils for going into cavities etc. In here, there's cavities in there you have to get in there. Not to any not to any fanatical extent. Just right. Thanks, Mary. You're doing great. <laughs> there's some little bits in there, but they're actually very hard to get out. So they're adhered very well. They're not going to do any harm. You can paint over those. 
they're, you know, they're, they're really attached to the underlying metal. What we're trying to do is keep out moisture at all costs. Right. Thanks. Yeah. No, this is going to be controversial. I agree with Owen. Don't sandblast the monument. <coughs> but not everybody listens to that. If there is sandblasting going on, you can sandblast the railings more than what you can sandblast the monument. Maybe forget the monument and just sandblast the railings <laughs> in situ. Um, if you're doing so, they must be painted within one hour of sandblasting and on a good day. I don't mean, you know, sandblast, we get a shower and we paint them. No. It has to be dry and has to be, and has to be painted. That first coat, just the first coat is all, is all you need. Is that a primer? Yes, yes. Uh, I'll come to paints in a minute, um, but yes. Um, basically, what I'm what I'm advocating in this is to hold on to the artifact, hold on to the railing, hold on to the gate. You know, you can have a railing there for for 150, two, 200 years. Half an hour with a grinder and it's gone. We're trying to save that. Um, you know, the metal is deteriorating ultimately. A thousand years will be probably, you know, at best it'll be gone. Uh, there'll be some time when it'll be gone. We're trying to hold on to that for as many generations as we possibly can. The most permanent thing of all is damage. Can't get it back. So the electric tools might be too harsh. Huh? The electric tools might oh, be yeah. too harsh. Oh yeah. Yeah. Uh, Thank you. This thing I came across a couple of days ago. I did it at home. Horrible thing. So, and so I said I include it. To say do not use these. The amount of stuff that was coming off would do. It's only looking to do damage. And also, do not use a grindstone or a cutting stone or anything on it because you're talking about loss. Just, you know. We don't want to be taking anything away from it. That goes for one's monument as well. No. Galvanized steel, I'm about to do a job and I'll be, I'll, I'll be, I'll be washing it with detergent and pour washing it. Galvanized steel is a complete envelope on, on steel. So as long as I know um, ways into the steel, I know cavities, that's all thing which there shouldn't be. I think the detergent and pore washing are going to be fine on it. Now what the detergent does to surrounding only vegetation, that's all thing I don't know. I don't want to be liable for that. How would you recognize galvanized steel? Good question. It'll be fresher than heritage ironwork. Um, it'll, look, it'll look newer. Even if the paint is tatty on it, that's all thing. It will look away newer. Uh, you'll see wells on it. <coughs> Whereas you'll see more clean lines on, for, on forged and uh, cast ironwork. You know, when, the, when you have a rail and a bar coming down into it, that'll be clean there. Invariably on... Um, on a galvanized steel one, you'll see wells on it. This applies to galvanized steel. It's scotch bright. It's scotch bright. It is the kind of industrial version of what's on the back of a scouring pad. And that's very good for getting a key on painted galvanized. But even, you know, what we're speaking about here is, um, you know, that heavy once every 20, once every 30 year um, clean up of the railing. But in the meantime, you'll be doing intermediate coats. Maybe just one, maybe just one coat, just to, just to freshen it up. That's sort always of great to get a key for that one coat. What is it? Uh, scotch Bright. Scotch Bright. Uh, no. 
key. What is it? What do you mean by otherwise get a key with Scott Sprite? It could be. It's not a lot. It's a surface. It's a surface. It's a surface. It's a key to the surface. Oh, yes. Yeah. If you get loose paint, do not sandblast uh, anything that's galvanized because the galvanized is only about 80 microns thin. Um, and, and, and if you lose paint for the intermediate coat, you know, for these intermediate coats that you might be doing, say, once every five years or something, and if the paint is loose, feel free to use one of, one of, one of, of these two or both and use the scotch plate for the bits that are not loose. That will, you know, and if you're doing that, what you recommend it to do is I'll be talking about kind of three paint, three coat paint system in a minute. Uh, better off going back to primer. If you are going back to metal, because of you found loose paint, and you're you know you're going back uh, a good bit, put a primer on it, put a build coat on it, and put a, a top coat on it, and be fine again. Um, off the railing, that bottom rail can be inch and a half, say two inches, up off the stone or ground or whatever. In heritage ironwork. That is generally unreachable. That's the bit that we have to forget about unless we're going to take the railing out. It do, it, there is some cavitation there. You see there, it is dished in a bit, but it is not as the corrosion is not as pronounced as what is on the top. Unfortunately, you're going to, you're going to have to forget about that. Would you smother it with paint? Yeah, but you're only, you're, only, you're only painting top of rust. That's the problem. Isn't there, special, isn't there a special paint that goes on rust? Do you know the thing I'm talking about? Uh, right. A rust paint. It's a treatment and a paint. There are treatments. I haven't used them, and we haven't we haven't been using them in heritage ironwork. Okay. Um, I'm them aware of them. They're kind cars. of converters. They're, they yeah, are acid converters. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. I don't know how well they work on heritage ironwork. Yeah. So unfortunately, I can't answer that one. Okay. Fair enough. This is, this is what kind of coming to the Heritage Police section now. Uh, what can and can't be used? What can be used? Small grinder with a stiff cut brush with all the, with all the warnings already mentioned. Hand wire brush. These actually have improved. You know the, old, you know, the one that was available a couple of years ago? Uh, they're still available with a big wooden block up here on the handle. I find these are way better because they, they, will, they will go in a whole lot uh, further. Scotch bright files, scrapers, uh, pneumatic needle gun, you have to have a compressor for it. It can be handy where, you know, with the cut brush, when you have finials, that sort of thing, you can only go so far with it. And you want to have, you know, this kind of triangular piece that you can't reach. Uh, just for kind of scrapers and all that kind of thing. But if you're really tooled up out with these sort of things, you have to compress it to drive them. They'll do kind of flat surfaces, needle gun, they're like little small chisels. They won't do, they won't do um, any of the vertical bars or any of that sort of thing. They won't do any curved surfaces or small surfaces, but they will do something flat like that. They're handy for that. Don't, cast iron is a very brittle material. The one thing that you can't put with it, or you can't do, do it, is any form of impact cleaning. Um, and you can't go too close for this, you know, straight into it. You can kind of glance off it because that would become an impact. It's very brittle and it breaks. Small oscillating sander. This sort of thing can be handy. And you get these little blade, this sort of thing. You know, kind of go into corners, that sort of thing. And you can get little blades that fit to it, that become a scraper, a mechanical scraper. Again, don't let this go right up against something in uh, the likes of a cast iron finial because it becomes an impact tool. But for, you know, uh, flat surfaces, that sort of thing, or awkward to reach surfaces, they can be handy.
Paul washer. No harm to give it um, a bit of washing before you start. It's used to rain and it's used to water. The paw washer isn't going to do a whole lot of damage to it. Various gardening tools, as I mentioned, for give, for give you a good footing. Paint brushes, such as obvious, sand blasting, controversial, other forms. Um, Soda the blasting. Did I come up and, oh, sorry, I said I didn't discuss it. Mm -hmm. I must come up on another sheet, uh, in, in another page. Soda the blasting is using sodium bicarbonate. It's just kind of starting. It might be one for the future in where it needs to be portable. You can take it to a place in Cork, in the uh, Don Marina, but you know, you're talking about removal. To the most part, what we're speaking about here is doing something in situ. Um, but that will be coming available over time. It's looking very promising. Um, it, doesn't, it, uh, it doesn't pit the surface the same way sandblasting does. It just removes the paint and rust and that sort of thing, and that might be a very, very useful one in the future. Now, two main approaches to finish, at least from my perspective anyway. Uh, the first is, well, the second requires removal, so the first really is the one we're speaking about. Um, Three-part paint system is kind of traditional in the sense that it's been around for some decades and is very good. Uh, zinc phosphate primer, you know, it's kind of a heavy uh, amount of zinc on it, which will protect a lot from, uh, from the elements. In MIO, which is moisture oxide, which is a build coat, it gives the volume to, to the paint. Uh, followed by two coats of polyurethane top coat. That's the, that's the finishing coat. That's to dispel the water, to throw the water off. Don't be afraid of glass. Um, you know, there's a whole, you know, the whole kind of style thing going on in terms of matte paints and that sort of thing. They hold the moisture a hell of a lot more than, than the glass ones. The higher the glass, the, uh, the better will be the dispersion of water. If, it's being, if the railing is being removed, um, this has been controversial so far as a lot of the um, guides on care of iron work. The, there are some out there. Um, do not recommend it in that it is uh, non-reversible. That's one thing we're trying to do is to uh, do work that is, you know, that is reversible. Um, but I have removed it on a job up on the Western Road. And I, think I, I, I did an extensive work on a thing that I had uh, different owners, that sort of thing. Uh, it was a, a revisit, much more extensive. And I got it removed and I zinc sprayed it again. So, you know, people saying that it's not removable is, is not necessarily true. Um, the place I go to for that, it's done in Tralee. And they'll sandblast it again. I'll sandblast it for work. You know, for any, for, by the way, if you're doing any repairs on it, make sure the place around where you are repairing is cleaned because we don't be working anything on lead. You know, if there's lead paints and that's all thing wrong, we don't be working that. Um, and they, they zinc, they sandblast it, zinc spray it, and they dip it into a tank of paint. So anything that's missed with the zinc spray is got with the paint. Um, I haven't had any problems with it. Uh, well, th there was one. The owner's father died, and he he was he wasn't as confident. It took a while for him to get his confidence back. Uh, the death was very sudden, and um, he didn't dip paint one piece. There was quite a lot of cast iron on it, and I did have a bit of trouble with that one. But that's the only one in 20 years. Uh, so the, the, the paint dipping is working fantastically well. Uh, and then spray it then with, uh, or paint it, you know, sorry, not necessarily spray it, <coughs> I spray it. But um, you can paint it then with two coats of two-pack paint, and that will do. Depending on where you are, you know, up by the sea, you're, um, you know, you're lucky if you get 10 years out of it. Inland you will get 10 years out of it. But then all that will need then is just uh, a recoat. Scotch Bright um, and another single coat, and that'll buy you more time again. Maybe five this time, because you're only doing one. Not to be used. Flame. 
it can crack the the cast iron. Uh, when you're heating cast iron, you have to heat it very evenly. If you heat it from one side, it's cold on the other. It doesn't take that thermal difference at all. Uh, also, let's say the likes of this. Say if, you're, say if you're heating around here for taking out paint, etc., you're melting lead. So you've lead fumes now on, on the side, you're breathing that. That is not, we, we, we just want to go there, it's just not good. Lead is cumulative in the body, so you never lose it. What's the lead for initially? Lead was actually a very convenient material for holding things together. Um, so you have this piece, this little piece. And it's you know lo loose on the bar, so you put it into place and you pour lead in here. Sort of a matchstick, is it? Sort of a was it a matchstick? A matchstick? Matchstick. Matchstick. Yes, 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 yes. It's present day matchstick. Yes, I am. For making joints. Huh? For making joints. Uh, for holding things. Yeah. yeah. You'll see there on on the first picture where the um where the leaded pockets for um, we go back to just to this one. There. This is all leading. This is typical of Cork and Limerick. Cities more than the towns, really. All the, the towns a bit uh, at times as well, where there's no bottom rail. So all the uprights go into the stone. These were leaded in. They'd pour in the lead, uh, and then they'd cork it. You kind of a blunt chisel, and you hammer it in because it's amazing. You know, you can say you do all that, and after an hour you come back. You know, and the railing is quite is quite loose because as the lead um, hardens, so it, as the lead solidifies, it shrinks a bit. That could be featured on a, on contemporary lead as opposed to old lead because a, a fellow. Working in the castle there, so that I know he was getting laid out of this thing and didn't seem to shrink at all. But the most part it shrinks anyway. That, you cock that in. The expansion of the metal and the stone. Huh? To keep it from cracking the stone, is it? No. To, hard, oh. to, to take up the space of the contraction because the lead is less. Yes. So you hammer it in yeah. and it fills into the pockets. It also keeps, if it's done well, it keeps the cavities that can lead to rust away as well. You want to try and fill that in as much as you possibly can. You know, round a couple of times. And we round it. Not a sharp chisel, very, very rounded chisel. Um, you know. <coughs> Not to be used. Grinding, cutting, no. No, we're ta that's taking away from what we have. And we certainly don't want that. We're trying to leave as much as we possibly can for future generations. Next point. Uh, that joint I had earlier on. I remember if you that joint. Oh, thank you. This one. Chemical cleaning on heritage ironwork is a no-no. See this joint here? These tenon joints. They necessarily have cavities in them. It's part of the working of it. And they will take acid. They will hold it for uh, until, until, it, until it self passivates. So it's corroding for quite some time afterwards. They're just absolutely no -no. New pile of damage. Um, powder coating. No, it looks great at the start. It's supposed to be maintenance free, which actually isn't true. Outside, which actually is true. It is maintenance free. You can you can maintain it. Um, it fades. It fades horribly. You have a black that becomes kind of very mottled grey after about ten years or so. Um, it chips, so you know if it's chipped on iron, it's supposed to galvanize. If it's chipped and galvanized, 
it's not so bad, you'll still have your railing and your gate. They will be still there. But if it's on, you know, heritage ironwork, um, you know, the moisture is getting in there. You've also got, you know, probably cavities running down along the bar, etc. Just not doing any good. You'll have to wait now for, the, for those to burst out. And, you know, you, you can't do much with it. You can paint it, it's a form of plastic. You can't paint plastic. And um, you're stuck with it. Steel wool, it, um, you know, when you're using it, it breaks up. Those pieces will go down into cavities and stay there. You won't, you won't get them all off. That's the, that's, that, that's the rust starting again. So that's just, that, that's a no-no. No. That looks really sad, doesn't it? It's all over, eh? No, we won't. The frame is good. It looked worse than what it was. And so, you know, a lot of stuff can be, can be brought back, can be given you lease of life. This is where, here's my final bit. This is where a railing was galvanized. And the melting point of lead is way lower than the melting point of zinc. So the zinc ran out. This one here, there are some more on it. This one froze. That's held by, that's held by zinc. All these in are welded. This lot at the back, some of them at the front, to hold them in place because they were just rattly. Mm. Now, there are other things I can go on about, you know, that I could go on about in terms of galvanized, but just, it's just no. Also, future generations can't, can't work on it either, which in a sense is a bit unfair. We go back to more cheery notes. That's all I have to say, folks. Fantastic. Any questions? We had a gate like that, and we had to broaden it. Fitly, yeah. And we put in, we got a fella to put in extra layers. Yep. But the material he put in wasn't as good as the original, so it kind of rusts. Yeah. That, that paint that you were talking about, the rust paint. Yeah. It helps, but it's not the same as the original. You know the cheap bits. But yeah. What you, can, what you can do with them is if you sandblast the whole lot and zinc spray it. Oh, no. yeah. yeah. Sorry. Hi, um, I quote myself as saying pre nuclear steel. Is it true that there's such thing as pre nuclear? There and is. And that is a way better. The, yes. Than what we have now. Yes. I saw it last year coming up in auction. Um, it was pulled up from some ship. And it was a kind of an event selling pre nuclear steel. Pre so, would, so, so would like old clouds and old fire materials before. Tis the bomb in Hiroshima was the uh, was the event that I heard that caused it. You know the nuclear bomb. Yeah. A nuclear bomb caused the the ore on the planet to be of a lower grade. Is there something to that, or is it just apparently a it is? Apparently yeah. it is. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Sorry, in the back. Yeah. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll look back to this. Are you just asking about the finials, the cast iron finials? Yeah. If it's broken, how do you weld it? What you're probably better off doing is getting an adjacent one. If it's leaded on, you're fine. A gentle heat, take it off, mask up. You need a chemical mask if you're using lead. So I know, you're yes. I actually do that. I won't go near lead without having a full mask uh, on me and get it re and get it recast. Recast. Yeah, I've done a lot. Uh, I've done a lot of work with. Um, we're trying to find good ways of welding cast iron, and I found them fine, but I find them inherently ex uh, expensive. So to the most part, I, w I, the likes, uh, I certainly won't weld cast iron on its own. I'll incorporate, I'll incorporate cast iron welds into a job, but I won't weld them on, on their own. When I did proper research into it, I found that the price was prohibitive, yeah. These, the, actually, the cheapest thing to do is to actually get it recast, if you can. Yeah. For, for instance, if they're colours, if they're colours, get the colours half done. No, but if, it's the, if it's the arm that's broken, the, the wing, the wing, or whatever, the spear, the spear is broken. If you can't get it recast. It, uh, it can be re-welded, but the casting is cheaper. All, uh, casting really only, 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 only when it's necessary. 
Read it in this message. Just leave it broken as it is. That's the other option. Tells you the story, doesn't it? Tell you the question. Yeah. What, what have you found? What color have you found? Oh, th this one actually, I was doing this last Sunday night. There's actually a little bit here. I took it on. I love that. It started with a red, with a, a red primer. I, 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 I don't know what the problem is with this is. It looks like it might be on the shirt or something. Yeah. Thank you. Too much movement. <laughs> That's fine. <coughs> So there's a red there's a red primer to begin with, but there were these lovely greens <coughs> afterwards, which suggests that it might have been close to a church or something. Dark green, yeah, yeah. Yeah, kind of a bronze with green, that kind of thing. <coughs> Does the lead interfere with or react to the rubber in any way? No. No, no, no. They seem to get on quite, quite uh, well together. That's the whole thing. Going back to the likes of the rivets, they were speaking about where you can rivet up the two bits of railings. You know, an obvious thing to use would be copper or brass. But they, they, they have a bad reaction to the surrounding iron and weaken it, eat it away. So, not good. Uh, and laden, laden iron get on very well. What's the difference between rough iron and mild steel? Wrought iron is, there are a couple of forms of wrought iron, it has its own history. Um, the more common version is an industrial version that we had from kind of the early 1800s on, uh, onwards, uh, where it was a form of puddled iron. Um, they take the billets, they decide, you know, uh, you know, they could at this point go either cast or wrought. And they, uh, they remelted them. And they can kind of stir them. There was, you know, there's a thing called puddle iron where they'd stir it around. That's all about, you know, do, I know they're adding more to it or not, but they take it out. And it's very kind of a, a spongy material at this point. And they'd hammer it or, uh, under mechanical hammers. And they try and squeeze out. You know, they, they would return to the heat several times. And they'd keep on pounding it to squeeze out an awful lot of the surplus, things like. Silica, you know, the silica's out, that sort of thing in it. They wouldn't get it all out. Um, they'd get a lot of it out, and then they'd start to roll it. Uh, mild steel is, a mix, is uh, basically iron and carbon, some other things, some, some other bits as well. And um, it's a very uh, homogenous thing, it doesn't have that grain. It's kind of the same all the way through. A lot more pliable, it's actually it's much different to forge than wrought iron. You're, like most of us will have, will have, you know, will have and and continue to forge steel all the time. We have to get into a much different mindset to forge wrought iron. Totally different way of thinking. Um, the steel actually is very forgiving in forging. You know, you can forge away and you can forge it almost down to, down to black and that sort of thing. You know, it's not going to do any funny stuff. Wrought iron, you have to forge it very hot. And if you go too far with it, you just have to break up. You have to forge it back to back into shape again. <coughs>